so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Terry Stratton, as probably most of you know. I'm a director of education and outreach here at the Guild. I am very excited to present this fifth in our new series of DGT Territory, uh, seminars geared to our musical theater writers. As always, if you have suggestions about who you would like to see or hear from, please feel free to email me and let me know. I will just put in a plug that John Wiley was our most requested. <laughs> I did not say that to everybody. He checked the archive video. <laughs> Let me remind you to please turn off your cell phones or pagers or anything that makes noise. John Wyman. Um, if you have a question, we'll have questions at the end of John's talk. If you have a question, please make sure you state it loud enough so our online viewers will be able to hear it as well. I hope you all picked up a program. There's some room there for you to take notes if you want. Um, I am very excited to introduce our panelist. Not only is he a uh, wonderful librettist, and um, there's no bio on your program. I apologize, but you probably already know that he has worked with Stephen Sondheim on three of the best musicals yet written, uh, Pacific Overtures, Assassins, and The Roadshow. He also worked with Susan Stroman on Contact. He worked with Michael Corey and Scott Frankel on Happiness, and also on a couple of little shows with Malty and Shire, Take Flight and Big. He also has written for Sesame Street and has 145 Emmys, thanks to that. And uh, my favorite thing is he was president of the Dramatist Guild from 1999 to 2009, which is when I got to know him not only as a wonderful, talented writer, but as a great person. So I'm very, very proud and honored to introduce you, John Wyman. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming here. Um, I, I have some notes, uh, not so much to remind myself what I want to say, but to remind, remind myself what I wrote, although Terry just listed it for me, so I should be able to hang on to it. Um, how many people have written books for musicals? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, what I mostly want to talk about uh, tonight uh, are the three musicals that I wrote with Stevie, and I want to use them uh, as examples to talk about what seems to me to be the fundamental book writer's task, which is structure, form and structure. Um, you know, um, there are a couple of things I'll refer to and, and cut, sort of get them out of the way because I'm going to touch on them later, but that's really where I want to go with it. Um, and I will try and get through this, uh, this sort of blowhard part relatively expeditiously because I'd love to answer questions, which I think is usually the best part of this event. Um, you know, I, j just to state the obvious at the beginning, uh, because it remains a matter of mystery to many people. I mean, the number of people who don't know what a musical book is is extraordinary. <laughs> and, I mean, I have been involved in professional theater projects where when I said I wrote the book, somebody said, oh, does that mean you wrote the book the show was based on as opposed to a, one of the elements of the presentation on stage? So I mean, I, just so you know, from my point of view, the book is um, everything that happens between the moment the curtain goes up at the top of the show and the curtain comes down at the end of the curtain. Uh, a lot of that, obviously, in a musical gets expressed in song, it should. Um, but that doesn't mean that it it is not part of the musical book. People, who, there are still people who think that, you know, that the the dialogue between songs is what the book is about. Um, and uh, I mean, we all know that there are there are books with very little talking that have extraordinary books like Sweeney Todd. There is there are musicals with enormously successful books that are sung through. Um, there are books with a lot of talking. There are great books like 1776. The point is that the I mean the book is play, part of which is expressed musically. And I remember 10 years ago, I got nominated for a Tony Award for Best Picture Musical for Contact, and somebody you know, casually came up and said, well, you really got away with that and won that. <laughs> and that was a difficult moment for me when I had to explain what the, what the book actually was. Anyway, as I said, let me just touch quickly on a, uh, a, a handful of elements that seem to me to be central to how a good book gets written, and, and, I, and I'll move on, as I said, to what I really want to talk about, which is structure. Um, you know, there are still people who think that, a, that writing a book is like writing a play, but with songs added, and we all know that's not true. Um, you know, one of the first things that obviously everybody has to, to 
tackle is the creation of a tone and a language which works in a musical but which would not work in a play. I mean, I've often said to people, if you, if you pick up, pick a good scene out of a good play and put it down in a good musical, people would wonder why people were talking that way. And in fact, the reverse is true. If you take a good scene out of a good musical and put it down in a play, people are going to ask the same question. Um, a large part of the task of book writing is to create a language which enables people to sing, but which at the same time seems as realistic when it's coming out of people's mouths as when Willie Loman talks in Catching the Salesman. Um, and it, it's, 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 it's a skill that can be developed, but it's tricky. And um, uh, I guess, you know, for me, the past master of this stuff, writing today, is, is Lapine. Um, the books to Enter the Woods, the books to Sunny the Park with George, I mean, they're all sort of perfect examples of the stuff that I'm talking about. I mean, in, in Enter the Woods, uh, James created a language <coughs> for those characters which uh, you become accustomed to and it sounds like people having a conversation, but it's not. Uh, the same is true with Sunny the Park with George. It's one of the reasons why, you know, for years people favored um, uh, period pieces for musicals because the, it enabled people to talk in a way which sounded like it came from elsewhere because it was France in the 16th century or someplace else. And it didn't have to sound um, uh, the way people sound when they're chatting. So, it, you know, that, that's, well, that's one of the things which obviously distinguishes book writing from, from playwriting. Uh, economy, it seems to me, is, is another essential one. I mean, uh, Somebody once said to me early on when I started to do this, they said, you really have to learn to make your point. I think it was Uncle Ron. But he said, make your point and move on. Make your point and move on. Uh, there is no luxury in writing musical books to, to slide off into the kind of digressions that sometimes drive a play and make it powerful. Um, uh, every, every word has to be necessary and sufficient and the trick is to deliver economically what needs to be delivered without it sticking out like a sore thumb and seeming like it's exposition. Um, and finally, clarity. I mean, uh, you know, again, I, which is all these things in a, in a way are, are references to the same skill. It's 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 delivering information which is economical, which has its own sound, allows people to sing, and which has a clarity which an audience requires when they're being confronted with uh, uh, all the different elements that make up a musical. There's music, there's dances, and, if you, and you know, as we all know, the score won't work if the audience is lost. Um, there, there are plenty of shows that worked well that didn't have particularly good scores but had strong books. It's very hard to think of a show that worked that had a strong score and a weak book. Um, uh, the book is just foundational. Um, okay, but as I said, I, what I really want to talk about is what seems to me the essential book writer's task, which is um, is the creation of structure, essentially the creation of the framework that supports everything that makes the musical. Um, you know, it's the the notion that form follows content is a cliche, but it's it's a cliche that's worth remembering. Uh, it seems to me that once you are clear on what you really want to write about. Uh, you're then in a position to devise the most effective way to design a show that will deliver that content. And, um, uh, and I'll get to this a little bit and use myself as an example. Um, until you are clear about the content, until you are clear about the story that you want to tell, it's really impossible to design the show that's going to tell that story. I'm going to use the form and structure sort of interchangeably, which is, isn't exactly fair, and you can call me on it later, but it's fair enough, it seems to me, for the purposes of what I want to discuss. So it's like, what's the story you want to tell? What's the content? And what's the most effective form in which to tell it? Um, I am going to talk about the three shows I wrote with Steve. Um, one has a, quite a conventional narrative structure. Uh, one started out with an extremely unconventional narrative structure, but in ways which I've revised the book over the years, the structure, even the shows very exotic, has become more conventional. 
Uh, and one has a structure uh, which is all its own, it's really not like anything else, and which was driven entirely by content, and the structure itself reinforces the impact of the content. So, I mean, that's, you know, I'll get to that at the end. That's sort of the, it's the piece I'm proudest of, and it's, it's not just because I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with the totality of the piece, but because I feel as though it, it's the best example of what I'm talking about. You know, the show is assassins. There, there are a lot of different ways one could have taken those eight people and told their story, but the structure which Steve and I developed, uh, it seems to me, totally reinforces the impact of the piece, and I'll explain why when I get to it. Um, so let me start with Pacific Overtures. Because um, this Pacific Overtures presented a particular problem from a, from a book writing point of view. Um, it was written in 1976, and what people knew about Japan in 1976 was essentially nothing. I mean, they, they knew uh, Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. You could probably get sushi someplace in Manhattan, but if you could, it was only one or two high-end places that the Japanese went to. Um, so although we were telling uh, what, when it's boiled down to its basics, was a sort of a fairly conventional narrative story about two men um, uh, who are confronted with a crisis and who react to it in different ways, um, uh, we had to explain the context of the piece as we went along. I mean, if you were writing a musical about the Civil War, about two brothers separated in the Civil War, you don't have to tell the audience that there was a country called the United States and that in the South they had a plantation economy and that, that involved slavery and that you don't have to they bring that into it. Pacific Overtures, nobody brought anything into the theater with it. So from a book writing point of view, the task was not only to design the story uh, and deliver that story of, as I said, what happened, yes, to the country when Commodore Perry arrived, but what happened to the country seen through the eyes of two men whose lives were affected by it. But we had to provide the historical context in which the story would make sense. Um, and, you know, again, with the notion that the form follows content, there, there were we devised really two solutions to that problem. Uh, one flowed largely from Hal Prince and from his desire as a director uh, to use Japanese theatrical techniques on stage um, to create a kind of a hybrid of um, Western musical theater techniques and primarily kabuki, which is very vivid, and kind of like musicals in a lot of ways. But kabuki had certain conventions, including, most importantly, a, a kind of narrator, figure was called the reciter who would sit at the side of the stage. And um, occasionally, in our case, in Pacific Overtures, he would move in and out of the action. But that enabled me to deliver uh, information which it would otherwise have been very difficult to deliver to the audience directly out of that character's mouth. He could just make statements. He could tell people where they were and what they needed to know. And absent that device, um, uh, orienting the audience could have been extremely complicated. It was complicated anyway, but that was a huge help. Um, and narrators, book writers use narrators, they crop up, you know, from time to time. Um, they're most useful, or it seems to me they're, what's the word I want? I was going to say forgivable, that's not the word I want. It's, um, uh, the narrator in Into the Wood, for example, becomes an integral part of what uh, really Steve and James were doing. I mean, the fact that the narrator is cast out in the middle of the second act um, uh, is an important part of what the, the story's about. He's not just somebody, you know, like the, the, the narrator in a play like Sideman or Dancing with Lunas, who's a kind of a memory play, this is the way it was when we go back. He's there for a reason, a narrative reason. Um, and given the way we used the reciter, you know, uh, it, because he was so exotic, it seemed to me that that was, as I said, both necessary and useful. The other thing that's interesting about the book, it seems to me, from a book writing point of view, is that um, uh, in part because Japan was so alien to people at the time, but also because it seemed as though it would support the central narrative, uh, I decided, you know, conversations with Hal and Steve, that the core story involving the main characters would be, uh, I'm going to call it decorated, although that, that, that's not really a useful word. It, it would be surrounded by a kind of kaleidoscopic 
snapshots of Japanese life, Japanese reactions to the American arrival, um, uh, typically involving characters you had never seen before and were never going to see again, um, and that this would generate a kind of um, uh, a, a collage of Japanese culture and Japanese life, and uh, the hope, the expectation was that this would, it would provide kind of cultural information and colorful information that would help the audience get comfortable with the show and help to focus on the narrative. Um, so the show we wound up opening on Broadway had a lot of that. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, the, the show begins with the reciter telling people where they are. There's an opening number which essentially describes the world of the piece, and Steve was brilliant in terms of what the number delivers in terms of what, sort of what you need to know about Japan. The Americans are arriving. We meet the two main characters, and we kind of, we're kind of with them. So you get to about halfway through the first act. And then um, uh, the first of these, uh, well, arguably the first of these uh, kind of snapshot scenes occurred, which in this case was a number uh, called Chrysanthemum Tea, which is about the shogun's mother poisoning the shogun because he's too weak to deal with the Americans. Um, arguably, we're still riding the main story there, but also arguably we're not. Uh, it, it's the, the, the incident, the event was irrelevant and it, it took people out of the story of these two characters, and then we put them back into the story of the two characters, but it's as if they'd had kind of a vacation from it. Um, and then a little further into the act, there were three of these kind of snapshot scenes in a row. One was a number, Welcome to Kanagawa, which is uh, kind of interrupts the story of these main characters. A group of prostitutes come down to the seashore to try and attract the attention of the Americans. Again, characters we've never seen before, we're never going to see them again. Steve wrote a funny song, although he still doesn't think it's as funny as he wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, they disappear. That scene was then followed by a uh, scene in which the Americans and the Japanese exchange gifts. And sort of the point of the scene, to the extent that there was one, it certainly seemed so at the time, um, was that the Japanese had sort of, sort of a small collection of delicate boxes and stuff like that. And the Japanese, I mean, the Americans had stuff that you would buy at a, at a hardware store. I mean, they had uh, coils of copper wire, and they had a telegraph machine, and they had a locomotive, and it was all, this was all accurate. It was all historically accurate. I mean, the stuff the Americans brought was hilarious. Um, so that happened, and that was then followed by another scene with a character we'd never seen before and would never see again. Uh, samurai whose job it was to prepare the Japanese defenses, and one of the things that he did was to stretch screen, screens across the top of the cliffs overlooking the American ships. This actually happened as well. And uh, his, his expectation was that the Americans would assume that there was a vast army hidden behind the screens, and, um, but that's not what happened. The, Jap the Americans were amused at this, you know, these parlor curtains that the Japanese hung up. So he was pissed off and he stalked off stage. And then we sort of went back to the story. Um, in the middle of the second act, uh, when the story of these two guys is kind of tumbling forward, there was another scene uh, which involved the intro. Uh, described essentially how the rickshaw was introduced to Japan. There's at least one school of thought that it was in, actually invented in the United States and introduced to Japan uh, after Perry's arrival. And um, the story stopped, everybody watched that, and then the story resumed, and very quickly we got to the point where a, a crisis was created and we were then tumbling into the climax. Um, one of the things that became clear uh, when watching the show on Broadway is that people had trouble hanging on to or becoming engaged with what was the central story of the piece, which was the story of these two men how one became more <coughs> westernized, one became more traditionally Japanese, and eventually at the end they, they, they fight, the one has become westernized, kills the other one, and that's really where the story was going. And, and the whole history of what was happening in Japan was riding on their shoulders. So the show was revived off Broadway in the 80s, and um, I, you know, Steve and I took a look at it, I mean it wasn't on its feet yet, I said I want to pull some of these scenes. And Steve was reluctant. He really felt that the, you know, the, the, that the balance between this central story and these other elements was sort of part of what we had created. 
And I said, well, I know it's part of what we created, but it's the audience, we're losing the audience. And so uh, for that production, I pulled out the gift-giving scene and pulled out the rickshaw scene, and I think something else as well. Um, the, these sort of snapshot scenes that had songs in them weren't going any place. Um, uh, because Steve was not about to write a new song, and, and the songs were good. But it was, it was an enormous help, and it was a lesson to me at the time that um, you can really be, you can be a little too smart sometimes for your own good. Um, because what we had was, uh, uh, or what I had as the book writer, was an, an idea which in theory was really smart, but which in practice was not. And, um, you know, if, if we had had more time with the show before it opened on Broadway, we might have made the decision we made seven years later and pulled some of this stuff then. But, you know, we were dealing with a show that was so exotic for most audiences, it was hard to tell what they were connecting to and what they weren't. It was, a, it was an interesting ride, that show. Mm -hmm. um, oh, but, you know, and, and one last word on, on clarity, because, again, this is, as I said, this is a show where we had to we had to deliver the, we had to educate the audience because they're wrong with it. We had to deliver the context in which the story was taking place while we were telling the story. And there was, there were things that I fixed, little fixes here and there all the way along to try and cement the audience to that central story and to make sure they had the information that they needed. There's, there's a, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. I mean, there's a, there's a scene in the second act, which is, arguably one of these sort of snap, snapshot scenes. Three sailors have come ashore. Uh, they see a very pretty girl. They sing pretty lady. They think she's a prostitute. They offer her money. Her father appears and kills her. Uh, this provokes a crisis, as these events did in Japan. And um, the, the next event was the reciter at the side of the stage. Is that there's a lot of screaming, and the bodies are dragged off. The reciter stood and said, the Tokaido, the royal road from Edo to Kyoto. As they travel to the emperor's court, Kayama Yazayaman reports to the shogun on the murder of the British sailors. Abe, are you sure the indemnity was properly delivered? Kayama, my lord, I gave it to the English ambassador myself. And he was satisfied? With the money, yes, my lord, but he insisted that he receive the emperor's apology to Queen Victoria in three days' time. This all seemed abundantly clear to me. But, um, you know, I could tell from watching the audience that they just had this very clear scene, although it's not writing on the story of these two men. And then all of a sudden somebody stands up and says the Tokaido, hello. This is a word they've never heard before. And it was hard for them to catch up with the information in this exchange of dialogue. So uh, for the off-Broadway production, I, I, I added this. Um, the same scene, pretty lady, soldiers killed. But then the reciter stands and said, the murder of these English sailors is no isolated incident. In Yokohama, a French diplomat is set upon by a samurai and cut to pieces. In Osaka, two German merchants are dragged from their club and disemboweled. The foreign powers rage and thunder, threatening to invade if the attacks continue. What is to be done? What can Lord Abe do, caught between the Westerners and the rebellious samurai who would expel them? The country trembles on the brink of anarchy. The Tokaido, the royal road from Edo to Kyoto. So it was, it, you know, it was, a, it was a matter of being sensitive to what people, the audience needed. And um, obviously, as a book writer, nobody will tell you more than the audience will. And, and you'll sense it. You know, uh, and sometimes sensing is not so great. But you, <laughs> you, but you will. And um, you, know, you can be stubborn. I, can I name names? No. Uh, a friend of mine, <laughs> a, friend, that's his, naughty boy. Uh, 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 a friend of mine who used to be the artistic, artistic director at one of New York's three major not-for-profit theaters, um, was doing a show with a director, uh, a director, and for the first 15 minutes, it was clear, he said, for the first 15, 20 minutes, the audience was totally confused by the piece. And... Um, uh, went out to have drinks with the director afterwards and said the audience is confused. And the directors, I'm avoiding gender again, the di directors said, oh, yeah, so? And he said, well, it's hard for them to catch up with it. And she said, 
Well, that's not my problem. He said, well, don't you want that? She said, no, this is the way I, you know. So you can assume that position, but uh, I would describe that position as bullshit. <laughs> you know, the theater is, a, is a, a communal experience. It's not a painting and it's not a novel. I mean, people have to, there's a transaction between the audience and, and the authors, and if the authors are not giving a smart audience what it needs, then you got to, <laughs> then you got to, you got to write that, basically. So, um, okay, I mean, the second chapter I'm going to talk about is, uh, and not in chronological order, but I, I want to talk a little bit about um, Roadshow. Because, you know, Roadshow, of all these three shows, Roadshow is the one which has, certainly has, from a book writer's point of view, it has the most, what most people would consider the most conventional book. Um, it, it opens with Addison Meisner on his deathbed. Uh, he dies. His brother appears. Uh, the two of them play a scene together in which they become more and more annoyed at each other until they begin to have a fight. The fight becomes childish. Uh, their mother tells them to pull themselves together and stop. And now we've, we've now flashed back to them as kids at their father's deathbed. And the show then tracks really a chronological order of what happens between the two of them uh, until we come back to the end when Addison is back in his deathbed. He dies again. His brother Wilson appears. They play a last scene, and we're out. Um, there's nothing... There's nothing about the structure of the piece um, which either undermines or particularly enhances content. And and I must say, Steve and I were entirely satisfied after an extremely long period <laughs> of time with the piece we wound up with, uh, with Roadshow, with the piece we wound up with the, at, the, uh, at the public, directed by John Doyle. Um, and uh, Doyle did it again at the Chocolate Factory in London where we tweaked a little bit more. And it was like, okay, good. Um, but unlike Assassins, uh, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and Pacific Overtures, I don't know that Steve and I were ever entirely on the same page in terms of what the theme and point, in other words, the content of the story was, why we were writing this show. Um, we were close, um, but there was never a real I identity until there was. Um, um, Steve had been very involved with these characters, especially with Wilson Meisner for years, Wilson Meisner for years and years, and he asked me. You know, you ever heard of him? I said, no. He said, do you want to read a book about him? I said, sure. I read it. I was very interested in the two brothers. But I was particularly interested in the period of time in American history within which they operated. Because they seemed to me to be these vivid examples of Americans behaving badly during a period of time when Americans really behave badly. Um, uh, it was not that different from the way in which many of them are behaving now. Uh, but so the balance between the sort of personal and the political was something I think which never quite sorted out. And as a result, as I said, I mean, form, the cliche form follows content. Whether there would have been another way uh, to organize the story, a way which might have had more impact, I don't know. I, it's not like there's something in the back of my head. But we never, because we could never quite get entirely clear between us on what we wanted the audience to get from the show, the next step of figuring out, well, what's the, do we make it a circus? Do we tell it backwards? Do we make it all midgets? Do we, we never, you know, as a book writer, we, I never got to that place. Um, and, you know, it was only when we had our first meeting, Oscar used to the public was hugely helpful in sort of, when he got the script and saying, you know, you gotta take this more seriously, think about this. But when Doyle, we had a meeting with Doyle, who had done Steve's, the show's with him. <laughs> he's, he's on stage already. But, <laughs> and, John, and John, who is wonderful, John read it. And we had a meeting with him, and it was sort of English diffidence. And he said, "Well, he said, tell me if I'm wrong." He said, "But you, I think you're writing about America, aren't you?" And I said, "Yes." <laughs> and and you know, we didn't rewrite much of. I didn't rewrite much of anything. Steve wrote a new song when we were in previews, a wonderful song. Um, but what John, the, uh, we well, that one it was very very useful to have a third voice clarifying for us 
what we were writing about. And as soon as he, it, it just sort of snapped into place and that everything was fine and it all went from there. But I've always wondered, as the book writer, what imaginative leap I might have made if we both knew exactly what we wanted, you know? And I don't know that it would have been any different from what we wound up with, but um, you wonder. And, and we certainly could probably save a whole lot of time in Chicago and elsewhere. Um, you know, there used to be, uh, I went out of town with Pacific Overtures in the, in the, in the old fashioned way. People used to go out of town, that was sort of the end of it to uh, Boston and um, I thought I have to read it Kevin Kelly's because I can't remember where I went after that. Mm -hmm. so, but, but you know, it was, it was that standard thing. We went out and checked into a hotel and again, somebody told me, I, it might have been Lawrence, uh, I'd say when you, when, you, when you go out of town, when you get to your hotel room, write down, no post-its at the time, write down on a piece of paper what the show's about and stick it to the mirror in the bathroom because you will forget uh, believe me, in the in the hysteria of trying to fix this and fix that, and um, you know I bring it up now because until we until sort of we got in a room with Doyle, I think if Steve and I had gone into separate bathrooms and stuck separate post-its on two separate mirrors, they would not have said the same thing. You know, whereas with Assassins, uh, uh, once we hit a certain point, if we we could it could have been like uh, uh, we could have done a nightclub act. You know, of, of the t telepathy, you know, I see someone writing, you know, and, and that's, it's hard to make that happen, but you, you really, as a book writer, you have to. And I'll, I'll interrupt myself for one minute before I go to Assassin's to, to also say this about book writing. I mean, I, particularly given the way the musicals are created now, um, it, it seems to me without surrendering, you know, my, my label, or my title, or my job, which is to be the book writer. Um, all the artistic creative, I'm not talking about the authors, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the, the book writer, the composer, and the lyricist, are all book writers in the sense that um, really to, to produce a, a satisfying work, all those voices have to be in a room together and have to talk until they're embarrassed about the fact that they're still talking and not writing, and, and come to a real agreement as to what it is they are, they are now all going to put down on paper. And at that point, the, the, the book writer, with a cap, now with a capital B, goes away and writes the book, while the composer and the lyricist with a capital C and a capital L go away and do their part. But um, uh, you know, unless everybody's writing the same show, you're screwed. And um, uh, I mean, if you're dealing with trivial material, maybe it doesn't make any difference. But if you're dealing with a musical that's got some kind of muscle to it and some kind of theme, some kind of point, um, it's it's just essential. And um, and and when those three book writers are in the room together, or it could be two, um, uh, you have to be honest with each other. And if you can't find common ground, you're better off not going forward, because it's the likelihood of discovering it afterwards is slim, on that cheerful note. Um, uh, let me talk about assassins a little bit. Um, you know, um, the assassins is the most satisfying writing experience I've ever had in the theater, and it, it's, it, it's for a couple of reasons. One, because I was writing about something I really cared about. I was 17 years old when Kennedy was killed. And I, I went to D.C. and stood on the sidewalk. I mean, I, and it never made sense to me. I mean, I, I, you know, all the conspiracy theories, I thought that you know, that kind of grief and that kind of pain, it just it didn't make, I didn't think about it a lot, but it, I couldn't figure it out. And it suddenly, when Steve and I started to talk about this, I thought, oh, that's what I'm writing about. I'm writing about who killed John F. Kennedy. Um, uh, it, but it also, as a writing experience, uh, it, I really was able with Steve to do what I just described. I mean, we sat in a room and we talked and we talked, and we came at this material from all kinds of different directions until we reached a point where we 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 knew what we wanted to write about. Steve went away to write an opening number, and I basically wrote the show, and then he caught up caught up with the rest of it. Um, from a, it's it's I won't say it's puzzling. 
it was, it was annoying. It's more like it. I mean, the the show again from from the point of view of the book, the show is is still is often described as if it were kind of a review, as if it wasn't so much written as routine. Like you could take these, you know, it's a bunch of people and there's a scene here and a scene there and a song here and a song there, and you kind of move them around. It would and it would, or, and you you know you. You'd wind up with a kind of a different mix, but it would still all be there. Um, and you know, in fact, the show has an almost Teutonic structure, which is which is beneath the surface because it doesn't have a conventional narrative. But um, the impact of the show, it, it seems to me, rides to a large extent on the degree to which I was able, as the book writer, to create that kind of structure for it. And um, uh, I've had this conversation with a lot of people because it's still, I still go, no, it's still, well, why don't you call it, don't call it a review. I mean, it, it and I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll take you through it in a couple of ways. Um, um, because I'm proud of it, basically. I mean, we'll just talk about the group scene. How many people know the show? Okay, good. Um, the, um, the first time, the first group scene in the show is the opening number takes place at the shooting gallery. Uh, everybody's got the right. And the assassins from different historical periods wander in. Well, let me back up for one minute to, to, to sort of prepare for this. The, when Steve and I wrote the show, the conventional wisdom about these people was that the reassuring conventional wisdom was that they had nothing to do with each other and that they had nothing to do with the rest of us, that they were they were like traffic accidents. They were like, uh, it was as if the president had been struck by lightning. There was nothing to be learned from these individual freaks, and certainly nothing to be learned by looking at them as a group. If you put them together, you'd just see a sideshow. You wouldn't see anything, you wouldn't see an act. <laughs> um, and when Steve and I first started talking about this, I mean, I said, well, if we do put them together, Let's talk and see if something emerges that we think is, is something valuable to write about. And we talked and we found that thing. And then, I'm back to the group scenes, then the, the, the structural issue became, well, what's the best way to deliver what we want the audience to understand? Um, so the first scene, as I said, uh, uh, observing what people, conventional wisdom was about these people, the assassins wander into the shooting gallery, each one individual. <coughs> they don't even seem to acknowledge each other's presence. They're not interested in each other. They've got nothing to do with each other. Um, they're, they're each, they've each got their own thing. And they're equipped with weapons. And uh, then a Booth, who's in a category of his own, goes off, kills Lincoln, has killed himself. And they come back to the second group scene, which is in a lot of ways sort of the first or conventionally we thought it was the first book scene. And all the assassins have remained together now in a kind of, they're not assassins yet, but in a kind of limbo, a kind of saloon-like limbo. And again, they're still, each one is really totally involved in his or her own thing. Um, Hinckley's writing a letter to Jodie Foster. Zangara's stomach is upsetting him. Um, Sarah J. Moore's trying to find something in her purse. Nobody is really dealing with anybody else or is interested in anybody else except for uh, Guiteau, who's, uh, uh, you know, can't shut up and is has gone through life accosting people and, and, and he's sort of working the room, but nobody is connecting to anybody else in any way that matters. Um, the next time these assassins come together as a group is that we're now deeply down into the show. Each of them has made an, the, each of them has made an attempt to kill the president. Some have succeeded. But they come back together and each of them Still, not connecting the one to the other, they, they reiterate their grievances and the reasons why they set out to kill the president. But that blends into something else, which is, I mean, it was a brilliant number, uh, another national anthem. But over the course of the number, the, it's as if they begin to notice each other and begin to recognize something similar that they haven't seen in anybody else before, as if they're kind of getting glimmers of looking in a mirror. So that by the end of the number, 
they've begun to see themselves as a group with a kind of a, with a common grievance, and that atomized boundary view of them as uh, isolated individuals has given way to something else, and they've become a kind of a team. Uh, and that team goes off to the Texas School Book Depository and recruits another member and is able to, mostly through Booth, but uh, by the end of the scene, uh, they all participate and is able with, in a very articulate way to explain to Lee Harvey Oswald why he wants to join this particular band of brothers and sisters. Um, and then Oswald kills Kennedy, and there's a final sort of post-coital reprise for all of them, which is still angry, but is also kind of weary. And But they're a group. I mean, they, they, we have taken them from the way they were generally perceived as individuals. We've put them together, and we believe in putting them together. We've said something about, about violence in this country and why people attack authority figures, particularly the president. Um, the, um, uh, just to, to be a, a last thing about the book uh, and about the structure of the book, which as I said is often viewed as a, as a review, in between the, 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 the books you and I described where they're, they're all kind of sitting around in this in limbo, not paying much attention to each other, and the moment where in another national anthem they actually come together as a group, each of them cycles through a similar experience. Uh, and the experiences are not entirely identical because that would become predictable and um, not interesting. Um, but the, each of them in a, in a variety of odd ways rubs up against another one or another two of them. Somebody provokes somebody else or the provocation uh, becomes significant enough so that that person that sets out to kill or to attempt to kill the president after the attempt, that character disappears from the show. They don't necessarily disappear from the stage. In good productions like Joe Mantello's at the Roundabout, they retreat upstage and they watch. But they're no longer part of the action until the group is ready to come together. And um, if you look at the construction of the book, as I said, between essentially between Lincoln's assassination and before we go to Texas, um, I very deliberately built a sequence of events which, which accomplished what I just described. And, you know, I guess the fact that people don't see it is actually a plus mm -hmm. because you don't want the stitches to show in something like this. Um, but I think they experience it because I think if they didn't experience it, um, uh, then, and not, you know, if they, they, they didn't experience it, the show would not have any impact. And for some people it does. This, I'm not describing, I'm describing a show some people don't like and, and some people do like. I really like it, but, <laughs> but that's me. Um, uh, but you know, in that sense, again, it's, I, mean, I can't think of a better example of form following content. It's like when S Steve and I, then I'll shut up. But I mean, it's like we started with this, with this view of who these people were and how separate and individual they were, and then uh, we created a structure which broke that idea down by letting them make contact with each other until they discovered that, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm not an isolated individual. He feels like me. She feels like I do. I feel better because I'm not alone. And that makes me powerful. Because I'm powerful, I'm going to go do something about it. And it's appalling. It's appalling. But it's, to me, that I mean, I don't ever expect to write a better musical book than that. And, um, you know, I guess there's one last thing I will say about it, because it, this also is an element of, of I, think I touched on it earlier, but tone, which is wrapped up with language and wrapped up with economy and wrapped up with all the other things I talked about earlier, um, creating the right proper tone for a musical theater piece can be very tricky, it seems to me, because it is, it's, it, it, it starts with the book writer, but the book writer can't control that. I mean, it has a lot to do, obviously, with, with there's other language in the piece, which there's the lyrics, there's music, there's dance, there's everything else. But I also, I do feel it's, it is part of the book writer's job to identify and establish 
what the tone of the piece should be, and that that tone's really, in nine times out of ten or more, that tone should needs to remain consistent from beginning to end. People need to feel that they're that they've entered a particular world and they can't be jarred out of it. I, I bring this up now because in Assassins, um, we made a deliberate, or I particularly in, you know, in the book scenes, I made a deliberate decision to do exactly the opposite of that, <coughs> to 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 change tones abruptly. Um, you know, the scene in which uh, Cholgash encounters Emma Goldman is a very straightforward, naturalistic scene, which I think works well. Um, you know, later in the show, uh, Squeaky Frome and Sarah J. Moore uh, attempt haplessly to assassinate Jerry Ford in what felt to me deliberately like a sort of Saturday Night Live sketch. And <coughs> I wasn't just trying to be a wise guy. I, one of the things that was difficult about this material, not difficult, one of the challenges, we used to use the word problem, now we say challenge. <laughs> <laughs> one of the challenges with this material was what is the audience bringing into the theater with them? And our said, start back to sort of the Pacific Overture thing, because these are historical, it's historical material, that the only thing they're bringing in is John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald. Because remember, this we wrote the show in 1990, so we were much closer to the Kennedy assassination then than we are now. And um, most people, given the age of most people who subscribed <laughs> to Playwrights Horizons, even then, most people had lived through <coughs> the Kennedy assassination. Um, we wanted to immediately knock them off balance, not just to prove we could do it, but we felt that we needed to disorient them, in a sense, um, uh, for two reasons. One, I mean, the, the smaller reason is so, in a sense, they would forget that Lee Harvey Oswald, the, the one person they knew most about, was not on stage at the beginning, and that it would be shocking when he appeared. And that worked. That worked. And it was, you know, even at Playwrights Horizons, where, you know, where the, where the critics hated the show, uh, and so did a lot of some of the audience, not all of them, but um, there would be gasps when suddenly the people realize, oh shit, they're going to, they're going to, I forgot, I forgot that, we're going to Texas now. But the other reason to knock them off balance was, and, and again, this is a book writing chore, was, as I said, there, I mean, to, the, the, there was no point in writing a musical that would say it's bad to shoot the president, <laughs> right? I mean, why waste people's time for two hours? You know, yeah. Although, you know, uh, there were critics who wondered why that wasn't <laughs> what the show had said. Um, but it was you really needed to, the book needed to be designed in a way that would keep startling the audience so that they would have to, I don't want to say catch up with what was happening next, but they wouldn't have time to sort of sit in their own thoughts about where the show had been and where it was going. They, they would have to catch up with the way in which it was, it was barreling forward and changing tones like that seemed like a really, really useful way to do it. And that's also why the, you know, there's, there's, it's certainly the funniest show I've ever written, which is kind of ironic. But, um, you know, that was also a deliberate decision. You know, not to be a smart ass, let's be funny about killing the president, but it, you know, the audience just needs to be knocked off where they were when they came in. And every decision that I made I had that in the back of my mind. And sometimes that's a good idea, and sometimes it's not a good idea. It depends what you're dealing with. But, you know, I, those are the kinds of book writing issues that, you know, that I wrestle with with these three shows. It's a help to wrestle with them if, with Steve Sondheim in the room, <laughs> let's face it. But um, uh, I think they, I mean, you know, I'm, and I'll stop there because I, I feel like they, they, well, I won't quite stop there. Um, you know, I, I, I did a show with, um, uh, and I think we'll probably do it again, uh, a show called Take Flight with, with Richard Maltby and David Shire. And it was a show that they had worked on, and Richard had written the book basically. They worked on it for a while, but they wanted somebody else to come in and work with them. And I really liked their work, and I liked them, and so I didn't want to do it, but then, okay, yeah, so let's do it. And what they had done, what Richard had done, was to take the Charles Lindbergh story, whatever the story is in this context, 
and the story of the Wright brothers and the story of Amelia Earhart and, and put them on stage together. And uh, the, the stories were fragmented so that you sort of would jump from one to the other. They never overlapped or intersected in any way. So they were proceeding down parallel paths. And um, it's like I had one, you know, beware of smart ideas. I had one smart idea when we were talking, before I said I was going to work on it, I said, you know, they have to, there has to be a reason why these stories are on stage together. And I, you know, I said, you know, most people think it was a triumph when Lindbergh landed and a disaster when Amelia Earhart disappeared, but Lindbergh's life was over when he landed. I mean, it was a disaster. The only time he was really happy was when he was in the air. And, um, you know, I got to believe on one level, the only time Amelia Earhart was happy was when she was in the air. So I think there's a scene where she tells Lindbergh, don't land. I'm not going to, and you shouldn't either. And he does, and she disappears. And all, so all of a sudden we were into it. But I, I sort of fooled myself into thinking that I had a book writer's idea for why these three stories were on stage at the same time. But I never actually could figure it out, except that they all had airplanes in them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, and, but, and there's some really wonderful material in the show. We did it at the McCarter in New Jersey. Is that New Jersey? Yeah. <laughs> Why do people always go like that? Um, um, but, you know, it's, I'm cycling back to the fact that, you know, there's some great songs, but the book isn't right. And it's, it's because in that case, despite all the, you know, wisdom I've dispensed tonight, I was starting with a form and trying to work from the form back to the content. And that could work, maybe, but uh, it's really hard and don't do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we may still figure out, I may still figure out something that knits these three stories together so that at the end, again, the point of view of the book, never mind what the score sounds like, you go, oh, for this evening to succeed as a piece of theater, these three stories had to be on stage at the same time. It was essential that they be on stage at the same time. Because if it doesn't feel that way, then it's, then, you know, the book doesn't work. And that's sort of where we're at. Uh, okay, I mean, I, you know, that, that's my speech. I would be happy to answer any questions about any of this. And not just about the shows I talked about. I mean, you know, about any of them asked by contact, any of the other ones. Yeah, I, I just, um, you had talked about how you have to sort of create a language for a book. Um, and how the, the language of a book wouldn't, would seem out of place in a play and vice versa. Is it possible to give an example of that? Um, <clears throat> the um, well, as I said, uh, you know, it, the the musicals where it, you can see it working best are uh, musicals which are set sort of elsewhere. Um, uh, fairy tale characters can talk in a way which James could invent, and you buy it because it's not going to be the way you and I talk. I actually remember uh, seeing uh, Sunday in the Park with George at the National uh, when it was first done in London and having a drink afterwards with the guy who played George. He was an Australian actor. He was, he was really good on stage. And um, and, and he said to me, I, I guess the show had kind of just opened and Lapine had been there for rehearsal. And he said, God, you know, I said, I got, and I think he, he wanted me to like support him in this. He said, mm -hmm. I said to, you know, I said to James, I said, why can't I use contractions? I said, why do I have to speak? <laughs> and, you, know, and, you know, it just doesn't sound, and James said, no, no, it's really, you, it has to be that way, it has to be that way. And, uh, you know, his, I think his hope was that I would go, yeah, why can't you use contractions? And I said, well, no, because I said, you know, it sounds, it makes the language sound like elsewhere. And, and that's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter that it's France. It doesn't, it just sounds like elsewhere, you know. And, um, uh, I mean, there, there are, you know, musicals, they're, they're, I mean, we're now seeing musicals that tell contemporary stories with contemporary characters. They seem to work best when they have, 
what are essentially rock scores as opposed to something you would recognize as more traditional theater score. Because I think you can go from a dialogue that sounds more like me talking to you right now uh, into you know the score to next to normal uh, than you can into the score to um, Oklahoma. Um, but it's it's you know it's the, the main thing is to it doesn't mean you can't write um, a, a musical that takes place you know in New York and keep that you just have to you have to be aware of it. I think that's really what the, that's really what the task is. Then you'll, if you're aware of it, you'll figure it out. Hi, John. Hi. Um, I have three questions. One per musical, next cook thematically related. Um, with Assassins, the the order that it's in now, was it always that order, or did you play around? What did, did you try other things? It, the, the order it's in now is like, we did a reading of Playwrights Horizons um, before I had written fully written the last scene, mm -hmm. and it had two or three other scenes in it that didn't belong there uh -huh. that I took out, but otherwise the order of the scenes is, has been exactly what it is now from the first draft. Uh -huh. Were you ever tempted to play with it? Um, when when um, we did a reading, uh, when Joe Mantello, Joe, mm -hmm. Joe was the perfect director for it. Because Steve and I found that over the years in New York, we would get approached by directors who wanted to do the show. And by the third meeting, it was clear. And Steve and I, despite having had the shit kicked out of us by the critics, always felt that we had written exactly what we wanted to write. Uh, you know, I guess therapy helps sometimes. <laughs> and, um, uh, and um, you know, so we said to Joe, what do you, because at the, the third meeting, somebody would go, well, it never it didn't work it's badly. My friends didn't like it. And, you know, you know, you gotta, we've got to tear it apart and put it back together. It's like, well, forget it. Joe said, no, I just want to do what you wrote. But in, in the first reading, he said, I, would, you, would you mind if I tried something? He wanted to move something someplace else. And, and I said, no, go ahead. Well, let's hear how it sounds. And then we just put it back the way it was. I mean, it just wasn't, it wasn't okay. a good idea. With um, Super Overture, when it was brought back as a roundabout, did you do any additional rewriting for that? Without, um, I did some cutting. Uh, the production of the roundabout was uh, disappointing, uh, only because um, uh, it was it, it, Steve and I, for very different reasons, were in Tokyo at the same time. Uh, he was uh, receiving the Japanese Nobel Prize, and I was like looking for work. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we happened to be there that when when the first Japanese production of Pacific Overtures was going up at the New National Theater. And um, so we went to we, we went to see it with some trepidation, and uh, it was it was brilliant. It was done in Japanese and by a director named Ama Miyamoto, who was a really interesting Japanese director. And um, uh, I mean, it was extraordinary. It had the ideas in it, the scenic ideas, but everything about it was it had nothing to do with what the production on Broadway came out. And um, that production in Japanese with super titles was picked up and came to the New York. Uh, at the Link Center Festival, and it was great. And you know, Todd Haynes got excited and wanted to do it at the roundabout, and so it was Amon came and did it, and it was sort of that production, but it, it didn't really fit into Studio Fifty Four. And I'm like, so everybody was kind of slightly bummed. And but I, but it was the same thing. I was sat in the audience, and I thought, you know, what, this is too long. There was a, you know, there was a the boat scene was too long, so I cut a page out of it. It was that kind of. Okay. Tweaking and trimming, but nothing major. Okay. And finally, about it's, it's all about rewriting. The, uh, I'm curious about the process from Wise Guys to Bounce to Roadshow. Could you talk about some of the things <coughs> you tried along the way that didn't work? How much time? Do you have? <laughs> um, well, the, the, I would say the the the, the big thing was that um, when. But Sam Mendes directed the workshop production of the Young Theatre Workshop. That was not a happy experience for anybody. But Hal Prince, who hadn't worked with Steve forever, was excited about it. And so Steve and I, who were a little shell-shocked, went to work with Hal. And um, Hal's enthusiasm drove some choices that, in retrospect, felt wrong. I mean, we created a, uh, a new character, a woman, who sort of uh, became a pivot point around whom the brothers 
operated and and you know but the part was played by Michelle Pogg and so it was like the best thing in the show. So, I mean the, the brothers were also I mean Richard Kind played Addison and Harvey Gillen played uh, Wilson so that I mean the, the actors as well. But um, when that sort of ran out of gas in Washington, where it got reviewed by the New York Times, <coughs> who were pleasant about it, but that's all they were. Um, we sort of went back and thought, well, what? And that's really how it got to Oscar. And Oscar said, you have to take this material more seriously. And we took the woman out. She didn't belong there. And really tightened in on the brothers and on the relationship between the two of them. And we made it um, uglier and more honest because it was uglier, I think, and, and clearer about what the audience was supposed to take away from it, which wasn't exactly a sunny, good time. Um, in working with a lyricist, how do you, are you involved in the process of deciding when and where a song comes well, in? Well, yes. I mean, um, um, you know, I've got to go back to what I said earlier. It's before anybody writes anything, it's, I think it's hugely important for everybody to talk, talk, talk until they're there's some consensus about what everybody's going to write about. And inevitably, that process produces a sense of what's going to be a, some idea of, of where a story point's likely to be a song and, and where it isn't. Do you find that you enrich certain things that make it easier for a lyricist to write a song? Yeah, I had, you know, look, I, it's, you know, things like this, when I get, you know, discouraged, I remind myself of this when I'm peeing at four in the morning. But, you know, um, uh, I told, when we were working on Assassins, uh, I said to Steve, I'm going to write a monologue for Leon Cholgosh in which he talks about his gun like it was a shoe or, uh, uh, you know, a frying pan, any other product of this, of the, of the capitalist factory system which was killing him and killing the other people like him. And, um, and, I started, he said, that's a, I want, that's going to be a song. He said, just give me rough notes. Don't give me, so I gave him rough notes. Then it expanded into this thing, the gun song. And, and you know, and then later on for another national anthem, we knew what the moment was. I hadn't actually written a scene. He said, have you got anything that you cut from the last scene? I said, I don't think so. Let me look. And I, I, there was a page I had written in which the, one of the assassins says, we're the other national anthem, we're the one. So I, I said, oh, here, Liz help and boy did it ever you know so it but when you you but that's a two-way street I mean you know when Steve and I would would pass material back and forth um, and because we were writing the same show it felt like we were writing with one pen um, it was a really comfortable prize doesn't mean we didn't disagree but it was a very comfortable prize you tempted to write lyric yourself no like in the first show I wrote Steve Sondheim I wrote the lyrics and I thought you know what I think it is, uh, why don't I just not do that <laughs> I'm interested in in getting your your feedback of what you do when you said you talk something you talk something you talk something you clearly some kind of consensus is meant i.e. content is achieved then you go off and work now how do you what happens when you come back together again do you T tell me a little bit about that. So I'm thinking about everyone off, everyone's inspired while they're in the room, but that they're <coughs> off and all other elements in life happen. And then, and then. Well, it depends how long, you know, how much gets, how, mu how much work gets done before you get back together. It's probably, in most cases, if, you've, if you're, everybody's comfortable with what you've kind of settled on, then you're gonna do work, you know, I'll write a couple of scenes, somebody write a song, like, you know, I like to write people, I like to write with people who are as slow as me. I worked on something with Aaron and Flaherty once, and, I, and Lynn and I were talking about something, and, and by the time she got back to her apartment, she called me to tell me. I said, "Would you just shut up for him? Would you, <laughs> would you leave me alone for?" But, but um, you know, I mean, with Assassins, you know, Pacific Overtures was written sort of a, a couple of scenes at a time, which went back to how was sort of the, the the center of that whole project. So it's a little different. But um, with uh, Assassins, Steve. Well, by the time Steve had finished writing the long opening number, I had sort of written everything except the last scene in Texas. And we, so we were ready to have kind of a reading, to hear what the book sounded like, and also to see how the tone of the opening number fit with it. I think maybe Steve had written another song. I can't, I think he'd written a ballad of Booth at that point, too. 
But it's 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 just it's but it's tri you know you you <laughs> you you sense it when no no you know what I need to be left alone because I ne I need to let my own imagination take over I don't want to talk to anybody else anymore right now or you know what this would be a really good time to get some feedback because I mean we you know working with Steve Steve is always. Um, exposing sort of first drafts of unfinished songs to get some sense from his collaborators. I mean, is this right? Am I, am I on the right track? Does this feel, you know, and that often produces something that, that changes the song or, or, you know, in most cases not, but it can happen. You know. um, Pacific Overtures, the um, second production, or, or say you were doing it now, again, and your partner was someone um, more compliant than Stephen, or more less towering than Stephen Sondheim, and you had complete control. Would you, um, if you called the shots, would you excise all those little snapshot things and try to integrate that into the well, story of the two men? Well, I, I did. I mean, they're, 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 those scenes are no longer in the show. If you, None of them. None of them. If you, if you license the show from MTI, you'll get a script that does not have those scenes in it. Um, if there was going to be another major production, I would have a conversation with Steve about because it's, it's totally open to this. I would have a conversation about Chrysanthemum Tea, which is a song that w will never leave the show just because it's such a... But it, I, I wonder how the show would play if there was something else other than that number that preceded it. Because it's it's um, it it stops the show in, in a good way, but also in a way that maybe isn't so good. I can't tell. It'd be no way to know without really seeing how it played in a reading without the song. It has nothing to do with the quality of the song. It's just it has to do with structure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a question about we've been talking a lot about the idea of maintaining clarity, and I'm wondering. Thoughts on maintaining clarity when uh, I mean I understand you want to make sure there's consensus amongst the creative team from the beginning, but as you get further into the process and you've got like three or four drafts behind you, possibly still in your head, and you're getting opinions not just from your own collaborators and your director, but maybe from other outside interested parties. How do you I guess it's sort of like how do you avoid the fog of war? How do you maintain calm and order when all around you people are going crazy? Or, or when chaos is... Um, it's very hard. It, it's, I totally understand what you're describing. And, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's, I think it's harder now than it used to be. I mean, the directors, uh, well, I, I take that back. I was gonna, working at a certain level, directors have been moved into first position as creators on musicals, which I think is not <coughs> almost such a good idea. Um, it's very hard to hang on to. It's very hard to hang on to, on to what your sense of what's correct is, um, <coughs> unless you really believe it. I mean, you know, as I said, as I was saying about you know, subsequent productions of Assassin. I mean, Steve and I had the, the sort of refreshing experience of Assassins being done immediately after it failed at Playwright, but it didn't fail creatively. It, it did sort of fail creatively at Playwright. So it was a problem with the design, but. Sam Mendes did it at the Donmar in London. It was everybody loved it, so it was like, oh, okay. It's like so we balance things, but it it um, you know we really had to hang on to what we believed in. And when we were working on, <coughs> you know, it's like how do wise guys get to be balanced? Get to be it, that's you know sort of addresses what you're talking about. It's like we felt like we weren't quite sure what we were doing, and so. It's not like we were being bullied into listening to other people. It's like we kind of lost our confidence. And that's a very, very risky place to be. Um, and, and when you are in that place, I think that you have to try and figure out if you've lost your confidence appropriately, meaning there's something I thought I knew about this material, but I'm not so sure now that that was right. Or six people are telling you, Six different things, or six people telling you the same thing, and you and you and you, and, it's, and it's wrong <laughs> for you. You know what I mean? So it's just it's just hard. It's hard. That's not much help, is it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's reassuring to know that everybody goes through it. Yeah, they do, and it, and, and they go through it. It never goes away. You can become uh, the most prominent person in this field, and it will never goes away. Never goes away. Uh, you were saying that musicals are never finished. They're only abandoned. Yeah. Um, do you agree with that, or I'm curious to know, have you ever felt, if you walked away from a project feeling like, that's finished, I did everything I could possibly do, or do you always have a sense of, that's where we landed, and, I'm, and I, that's what it is? Um, <coughs> Whenever there's a, a sort of substantial production of any show that I've written, it's like an opportunity to go in and kind of tweak things and fiddle with things a little bit. Uh, and I think that's that's different. That's not like, oh, I, I ran out of time, so I didn't get It's just like, yeah, you know what? It's, uh, for 25 years, nobody's laughed at that joke. Why don't I, <laughs> why don't I take a hint? Um, uh, but um, no, the Assassins, for example, we really felt we were we were finished, and um, and we stuck to that, you know, despite a lot of loud noise to the contrary. Now, you know, and then when I mean, we, production we got it around about was sort of perfect as far as I'm concerned. Every element, the, the, the Jules Fisher, Peggy Eisenhower, the Robert Brill, all the design. I mean, it was great. And but I wound up staying on stage at Radio City Music Hall, you know, accepting the Tony for Best Revival <coughs> Musical, and I thought. This is crazy. This is yeah, this is fucking nuts. I mean, you know, in 1991, I had to wear Groucho glasses to leave my apartment for <laughs> fear that people would jump on me and kill me. And now, you know, uh, everybody's cheering. But we we really believed that we had we had we had finished what we wanted to do. We did make one change, but not because of because it was because of a new idea. Um, when Sam Mendes was going to do the show in London. We met with him, and Sam said he, he felt like there was a song missing for one of the assassins. He, he wasn't sure what it was, but we, and um, you know, we talked about it, Steve and I, and we, neither of us felt there was anything left for either, either of the assassins to say. But we both, we sort of snuck up on that side. We felt that, you know, we we sort of the only real appearance in the show by people who weren't assassins were the bystanders who sing about how they saved Roosevelt. And they're treated as sort of comic. Characters, and, and we both felt that there there should be a moment where where a window is opened on the world outside the assassins themselves, and this the, and the, the <coughs> grief that results from these acts is put on stage. And I had been to Dallas, and I sent Steve. There's a lot of video from the sixth floor of the School Book Depository. It's an amazing exhibit now, and it's very moving. That's where something just broke. The song that entered the show came from, and you know, there's still some people who want to do the show without something just broke. But for us, it was like, no, that was the one missing piece. Um, but it's I, there's nothing about the show that I would change now. And I, you know, Happiness, um, <coughs> you know, which is a show we all really liked. Uh, Susan Stroman directed it, and, and Michael Corey and, and uh, Scott Frankel wrote the score. The critics didn't like it, but we did. Um, you know, that's a show where we, we also felt we were we were done with it. I think if we did it again, there's there's a song we might revisit, and there's one character I would fiddle around with. But we felt like we were done when we when we finished. Uh, during the script, you described the the narrator. You edit the narrator for um, the Hauswitz Exposition. Now, I'm writing a children's musical now. I'm deciding whether or not I should add a narrator. And I can imagine that whenever you're in the rewrite process, something's not working, you're always considering a narrator. Maybe you could talk about the use and misuse of narration. Well, you know, I, I think that um, uh, if, if the narrator is an invention in order to handle exposition that you probably ought to handle some other way, and you should probably feel that in the pit of your stomach, <laughs> then, it's, then it's probably not a good idea. Um, the fact that Kabuki theater, the, that the elements, the conventions of Kabuki theater included this onstage presence, um, you, on the one hand, you'd say, well, you'd caught a break, um, because there he was. On the other hand, the way in which he operated made him more than just a machine that delivered information. Um, 
On the other hand, if you, if, you know, if it's a piece for kids where clarity really is uh, crucial, then I don't think you should, you know, um, avoid using a narrator if there's a, if there's, a, if, if it's a really an integrated character as opposed to somebody with a big open storybook sitting at the side of the stage mm -hmm. in a rocking chair saying once upon a time and then, you know, just uh, going with that. It can be, it can be useful, um, uh, but like I said, it's most, it's most useful when it has a real, when the narrator has a real dramatic purpose like the end of the war. It's like someone's telling the story and then whoops, no one's, no one's telling the story. Now what's going to happen? Um, considering that book writer is a little bit of a playwright, um, it strikes me that people come to you with projects. Have you ever initiated something that appeals to you? Yeah. And how, how forcefully can you negotiate the book writer, composer, lyricist? No, I, I have. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I'm happiest when I'm working on something which doesn't feel like an assignment, a craft business assignment, which just don't interest me very much. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. It's not about, it's just, I, I don't, I'm really only interested in author's pieces, which Pacific Overtures, I think, is, and Sassy's is, and Roadshow, for that matter. Um, and which contact was. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at adaptations. I don't think, in part because, I mean, Big Big was fine, but it was, you know, it, it, David and Richard did a lot of good work, but it didn't need to exist. I feel like the movie was sort of a pretty perfect telling of that story. Why do we need it? Why does the world need it again? But so I do. I I get approached. I don't get as approached as much as some other people do because the kind of shows that I've written, I'm not Tom Neal, you know. And I, that's I, I love Tom, but I mean, if you're looking for somebody to, to fix your show and to adapt something, you know, Tom has a, a bag of skills that are, you know, are flawless. It's nice to do your own work. It's nice to be a playwright in the musical theater. That's what I want to say. Um, unlike a lot of people sort of entering the musical theater world, I mean, you <coughs> had it in your family. I was wondering if there was anything you learned about musical theater from your dad that helped you out when you were starting out. Well, the only thing I learned from my father was don't do it. He was, uh, you know, my father's uh, um, ambition for me was that I would stay as far away from writing as possible. He uh -huh. felt it was an uncertain profession, and uh, that's really how I sort of stumbled into law school and mm -hmm. then stumbled out with a musical about the opening of Japan, but uh, <laughs> no, although, you know, I, I, I don't know how old I was, I guess 12, 13, I mean, I, I was around, he was a novelist, and then all of a sudden he did a show, Fiorello, which was a huge success, it was glamorous, and it was good, it was exciting, and all the kids I went to school with wanted me to get him house seats, and, <laughs> and then his next couple of shows weren't a success, so I did get to see up close what the emotion that emotional roller coaster is like. Uh, so here I am anyway, but it's <laughs> you know I would say that you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know it's about, about the author <clears throat> wanting to be the author. I I remember um, reading in the Dramatists Guild Monthly um, a reprint a while ago from Alan J. Lerner, in which he said that. Um, for a long time, he and Frederick Lowe you know, banged their head against the wall until they finally did um, My Fair Lady. He said, and he said, 90% of the audience meant neither knew nor cared anything about Pygmalion or George Bernard Shaw. And he said, that's when they realized you didn't get any extra credit for an original story. Right. And from then on, they kind of, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, no, it's true. And I mean, and now, I mean, it, uh, producers are, are uh, Broadway producers, commercial producers, are, are, are quite open about the fact that they prefer the opposite. That that, um, that they they their argument is that um, and I've heard a number of people say this on panels and elsewhere. You know that I I need something. I need a a, a, a property that's already <coughs> branded, meaning it has to be a title that people recognize, 
because if they recognize it, I can raise the money, and um, if they recognize it, I can sell tickets. And if it's hands on a hard body, no one comes. Um, and uh, that's really depressing. Uh, you know, uh, it, it um, uh, you go back several decades, um, the title, the property, was not the centerpiece of the enterprise, the, the, the artists were. And that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, Rogers and Hammerstein wrote Oklahoma and Carousel, and, and then they wrote Pipe Dream. It doesn't mean that, that it all worked out, but, if, you know, that, the, the well, I'll say, I mean, the last thing I'll say is I, I do think that in terms of, you know, I think the, the surface, I won't say the surface has hardly been scratched, but I think the possibilities in what can be done in musical theater are sort of limitless, given all the tools that are available to create a musical. And um, what can be done with those tools is not going to happen in the four blocks around where we're sitting. It just ain't. Um, you know, you can just wave this real estate goodbye. But but that's okay. I was in Hal Prince's office years ago when they were, they were going to tear down the Morasco Theater. And they wanted Hal, the phone rang, and they wanted him. I said, what was that about? He said, well, they want me to come down to a protest so to, to save the Morasco. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, nah. He said, the theater moves. He said, it was on 14th Street forever. And then, and, you know, now it's on 44th Street. And they'll go someplace else. And, um, uh, I, and if you want to write musicals, I think that's correct. I don't mean that commercial producers are going to move to uh, Jackson Heights. But I do mean that there are plenty of places where <laughs> new work is welcome. It would be nice if it was more welcome if the finances of the country and of the not-for-profit theater made it more welcome, but it's still welcome. There's places to do good work. When we did Pacific Overtures, then I'll stop. But, you know, um, uh, Steve got in a lot of trouble. There's a piece in the New York Times which it was an interview he'd done in, in London before the show opened. And he didn't know it was going to appear in the New York Times. But in it, he said, well, you know, a chorus line, which was opened the same year. He said, you know, it's one thing to do that under the, under the cover of a not-for-profit theater. But, you know, the really courageous thing is for a guy like Hal to put something unusual like this on Broadway. That didn't help with the reviews very much. But, <laughs> but um, I mean, now that's, you know, the, the Broadway component of it is largely, largely over, you know. Um, I'm probably, this is probably going to be covered, but I'll ask it anyway. <coughs> if writing a book is like writing a play, why wouldn't you just write a play? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I you think... You have to deal with collaborators. I can't, I'm going to, I'll give you a very personal and non-generalizable answer to that question. I wrote Pacific Overtures as a straight play in the Yale Law School Library. And I did it because I could. I had a, All I needed was a pen and a pad. And I was in New Haven. It wasn't going to do me a good look for collaborators. Also, I didn't know what I was doing. I had never written a play. I didn't know how to write music. I didn't know how to write anything. Um, when, when the show became a musical, I discovered uh, two things. One, that it's, it's thrilling to work with somebody like Steve and somebody like Hal. I don't know what my experience would have been if I had been working with more ordinary collaborators. Mm -hmm. and, and I also, I like the collaborative process. I like the meetings, I like talking, and then I like the fact that ultimately I've got to go away and sit in a room just like I was a playwright and do my part by myself. So I feel like I, I get both things, you know. Um, That's it. <laughs> uh, this month there's about a half a dozen Broadway musical shows in here. Uh, and I see you as the theater of Jason Wood. Is there anything that's currently running that you feel works for you? Music, musical? I loved once. And, I, and I, I can't think of a musical I've seen since then that I, I just thought once was, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Stephen Hoggett and John Tiffany felt like everybody, Bob Crowley, felt like the show had been created by one brain that got passed around to each of the <laughs> participants. It just felt like it just felt like a like it was perfect. 
um, uh, I don't know that it's a great musical, but I mean, as a theatrical experience, I thought it was terrific. And I, I'm probably leaving something out that I've seen since then, but I can't think of it right now. a particular structure? I mean, you gave three plays, but they all seem to have a different structure. Do you feel that um, any particular structure for musicals you believe in, like a mm -hmm. preset structure? Or I don't, actually. I mean, and that's what I'm, you know, I was yeah. leaning on the idea that, you know, form has to follow content. Okay. The, the, you know, when you know what you want to write about, um, uh, then you, you have to figure out what's the most effective okay. form to cast it in. I mean, if you, I mean, if you look at, I'm just off the top of my head. I mean, if you look at Assassins is a good example, but so are so are Sunny in the Park of George and Near the Woods, which we've been talking mm -hmm. about. I mean, I was on a panel, I was on a panel with Lapine, uh, years ago at the, at the West Side Y, and I guess Into the Woods, maybe Sunny in the Park, one of the other ones, had just opened, and somebody said, you know, I just loved the first act, and it felt like the show was finished at that point. Why didn't you just? And he said, the whole reason we wrote the goddamn show is to write the second act. You know, but, uh, <laughs> those, those, the structure of those, the structure of both those shows is, is also extremely interesting. I mean, you know, they really, they round out, they sort of complete at the end of the, at the end of the first act, which is mm -hmm. not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to send the audience off, you know, wondering if, you know, perils of Pauline, are they going to get her off the railroad track? Um, and then picking up with sort of essentially a new idea and a new place for the second act. So, I mean, it, you know, and that's, that's another example, it seems to me, of, of, of designing a form that delivered what they wanted as authors, what they wanted to deliver. Great. Thank you, John, so much. Thank you. Thank you.